Welcome to the second annual Pitt UN convening. We're grateful for the opportunity to meet virtually. I wanna thank New America for agreeing to host this event for us. I hope that we will be able to meet in person in, at Arizona State University next year, where we'll have our third annual convening. Today's sessions are open to Pitt UN representatives, including designees, your development and communication teams, your 2019 grantees and our new 2020 network challenge grantees thus far, and our wonderful funders, which include the Ford Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, MasterCard Impact Fund and MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, the Rakes Foundation, Schmidt Futures, and the Siegel Family Endowment. On tap for the, for the day are the following. I just wanna give you a sense of what to expect and to give you a sense of the through line for the day. So we are going to revisit the 2018 definition of public interest technology, which was created by one of our first working group. Um, we have several members from the upcoming panel who were part of that working group, which includes um, Deirdre and David Eves. We also will then take a deep dive into the need for public interest technology across multiple sectors, sectors in our demand panel. And then we'll take a 15 minute break, get up, shake out your legs, refresh your coffee, and then come back for a highly interactive sessions around the field building areas with uh, Spitfire. Um, you all are very familiar with these five field building areas. And so we're gonna take a deep dive together as a group and exchange some of the lessons learned over the past year. And then finally, we're going to close out our internal meetings for the day with a presentation from the team from Handshake. They're here to demonstrate how you can use Handshake as a tool to help connect your students with jobs in public interest technology. And I hope that you will return at 7 p.m. Eastern to join us for our very first public event of the convening, Centering Racial Equity in Pitt with Elizabeth Garlow, the Deputy Director of the New Practice Lab at New America. Have no fear, we will be sharing this video across our platform. So please know that you are, um, if you've missed this session, if you've missed any of the sessions, we're hoping that you'll be able to access them sometime in the future. So stick around with us for the remainder of the day. And I look forward to um, the next two days of um, intense discussion and um, I just just want to I just want to say this as well that I want to thank you all for your leadership around public interest technology on your respective campuses. I hope that we will have a set of fruitful discover discussions that will only improve the work on your campuses and make public interest technology a viable career pathway for your students. So thanks again, and let's get started. Thank you so much, Andrean, and thank you for all that you and New America have done in organizing and giving life to the Pitt University Network. And thanks to all the, the techs and uh, all the support people who have uh, really put in an enormous amount of effort to bring us together in these strange circumstances. I see Z1s and Z2s and Z3s, and I know that they must be doing something uh, very helpful and productive behind the scenes. So again, I'm Dave Gustin. I'm the Pitt designee here at Arizona State University, and I direct ASU's School for the Future of Innovation and Society, which has issues around public interest technology as central to what it does in the world. And I also have a new role here at ASU as the Associate Vice Provost for Discovery, Engagement, and Outcomes in a larger structure called the Global Futures Laboratory. And it is really my privilege today to moderate a discussion that revisits the definition of public interest technology that the university network has been working with. Uh, we have uh, three of our panelists here right now. Maybe our fourth is going to show up. I know that she is on the other side of the planet and it's rather early her time. So maybe there are some, uh, some challenges there. I know there were some challenges for me this morning and I feel sort of breathless uh, to give us a little moment of, uh, of repose perhaps before we dive into this. Um, one of my 
uh, habits in trying to humanize this instrument of Zoom is when asking people to introduce themselves to share something that might be a little personal that they would not have you know, shared in a formal professional introduction, but maybe something that might have come up in the chit chat uh, before a meeting or something along those lines or that we would know from deeper dives into conversations that we are precluded from having. So I gave you my professional information. My uh, personal uh, point of introduction is that I have a black belt in Taekwondo. And I would also like to invite our other, uh, our panelists to share that personal information and also to, excuse me, to add a tidbit about what it is that perhaps spurred their interest in public interest technology, or what is the earliest memory of something cognate to public interest technology that they have. So um, after the introductions by the panelists, uh, we are going to uh, start the conversation by revisiting the definition as uh, Andrine had said that uh, David and Deirdre and their colleagues had posed for us a bit ago, uh, look at that, see what uh, how it's fared over the past year and a half or two years that the network has been full operation. Uh, then talk about other kinds of cognate terms, uh, responsible innovation, responsible research and innovation in particular. Hopefully Sujata will arrive for that part of the conversation since I had intended her to be principal in that conversation because responsible innovation is a framework that has been used uh, perhaps more globally. And as uh, the Pitt University Network potentially thinks about expanding into a global scene, the differences or similarities between the Pitt framing and the responsible innovation framing will need to be discussed a little bit. Then I thought we might uh, slide into discussions about Pitt uh, framings in the private sector uh, and how ideas like corporate social responsibility and uh, and its related terms and practices have evolved over time. And then uh, we will open it up for a broader discussion among all of you. Uh, so you've again, you've heard my professional introduction. You've heard that I have a black belt in Taekwondo and I have been paying attention to this sort of pit related stuff for so long that when I was five or six years old, my favorite book was a book called Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it is a great treat for your children or grandchildren and even for yourself. It is a depression era storybook about technological unemployment. So that was my first interest, adorable one in Pitt. Uh, now I'll turn it over to David Eas to introduce himself. Unmute myself because it's 2020. Um, the, so my name is David Eas. I'm a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School where my teaching focuses on digital transformation in government. I'm particularly interested in how governments can use technology to, to create and provide public goods more effectively. Um, Maybe the, the lesser known fact about me is I'm actually originally, I have also a career or maybe a side project as a professional mediator and negotiator. And um, I have a real passion for the environment. So I've worked with many, many environmental groups around the world, helping them think about negotiation strategies as they pursue their public policy objectives. Um, my early connection to thinking about technology, I think that the thing that has driven the, the memory I go back to is uh, I was dyslexic as a kid. And uh, I remember I had a friend whose dad had, you know, was involved in software and we didn't have a computer, but I saw that they had a computer and it became very interesting to me. And I managed to persuade my parents to get one. And I was probably the first kid who wanted to have WordPerfect and Microsoft Word on the computer because I very quickly realized that there was something called spell check and then ultimately grammar check. And I was probably the first kid to ever submit all of their papers like printed out. And I, I share all this because I'm fairly confident if it had not been for spell check or for grammar check, I wouldn't be here today, that I would have been streamed in some other way. And so there's a lot of luck and a lot of privilege that allowed me to get to that place. But um, I, when I look back, I think a lot of people would have said, oh, is that cheating? Or you know, is David following the system in the right way? But it was actually the only way that I was able to navigate the system. And so, Technology has shaped my life in such an important, profound way. 
David, thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. Um, now on to Deirdre. Hi, um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Deirdre Mulligan. I'm a professor at the School of Information. I also have an appointment at the law school. Um, I started my career at the um, in law, in public interest law in particular. And I, um, unlike David and David, uh, I got an internship at, the, I was at one of the first public interest fellows at Georgetown's law school. Um, and got a summer position at the ACLU. And I was offered a spot in a bunch of different um, issue areas. And the one that I chose was with the Privacy and Technology Project because the woman who was leading it, Jan Laurie Goldman, I had been told by High Feldblum would be a fabulous mentor. Um, and she was. And while I was there, I both realized um, how male dominated the field was that um, Jan Laurie, Kate Martin and I would go to these meetings with mostly FBI and National Security Administration officials around encryption policy. And so it was the sea of those, like the men in black, right? And these us and Dorothy Denning maybe, and, um, and realizing that this was a field that both needed to be diversified, but also realizing that um, I wanted to be a lawyer because I thought it was a very important tool for social justice. And because I was working on encryption policy, I realized that the design of technical systems could also be a really important tool to protect values that we care about. And so the reason that I moved from the law school to the School of Information after a career at the Center for Democracy and Technology that I helped start um, is because I really care about a set of social values. I care about social justice and the public good and both law and technical design as well as organizational design are necessary if we wanna protect them going forward. Um, tidbit about myself on the uh, following on Dave Gustin, um, I played soccer in college and I have continued to coach and play most of my life but having blown my ACL out three times, I know mostly I'm on the sidelines. Sorry to hear that. Okay, thank you, Deirdre. And now Sylvester. And so good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening, depending on where you are in our, in our big world. Excited to be here on this panel. I'm Sylvester Johnson. I serve as the executive director of the Tech for Humanity Initiative at Virginia Tech, which is our efforts to promote human-centered, humanistic approaches to technology. I'm also assistant vice provost for the humanities, and I direct our Center for Humanities. I uh, interesting factoid about me is that I uh, ran a cafe with my spouse some years ago uh, that was a uh, lunch and breakfast spot. So I know how to pull a mean espresso. If you ever need one of those, I can actually uh, turn out a pretty good one for you. Uh, so I am really excited about the Public Interest Technology Initiative and my own entry into this began with my work as a uh, Humanist, so the humanities scholar running a digital humanities project that required us to develop a deep neural network algorithm to process some of the correction that we were doing. And that turned into a 20 team AI project that I was leading that, that made me realize there was an interesting connection between the way many people in humanities traditions have associated thinking and reasoning. But being human, uh, me realizing at the time that there were increasing efforts to get machines to do what looked pretty close to what's called thinking mm -hmm. and reasoning or making decisions. And so I realized that there were tremendous humanistic questions about this. Uh, what is the place of humans in a world where increasingly we are becoming more sophisticated in our efforts to get machines to do things that we've been calling human? Uh, decision-making, decision trees, and the human-machine connections for a hybrid intelligent infrastructure. And from there, I began to understand that so much of the uh, institutions of power and the decisions that affect people's lives are being shaped by technology innovation. So as someone who has spent a lot of time studying uh, social systems like race and politics and empire and religion, I began to recognize that there had to be a much more robust engagement with technology from humanists in order to help address some of these larger questions that our society is facing. 
And from there, um, one thing led to another. I began to participate in a number of different efforts uh, that were individual and collaborative in order to garner a more robust response. And so really excited that our institution, Virginia Tech, is part of this Pitt UN network and looking forward to our, our work together to bring our best efforts to these important challenges. Great, thanks, Sylvester. Uh, doesn't look like we have uh, Sujatha uh, coming in yet, so I think we will dive in and I'll try to, you know, moderate a, you know, a lively conversation so that this effort does not contribute to the zoom and gloom that we've all been facing under the current circumstances uh, without having to resort to the mute button. Okay, um, so uh, David, Deirdre in particular, you guys were involved with the, the current definition that the Pitt University Network has been, has been using, and I'll, I'll read that for uh, the audience in its very short version, and you know, kudos to you guys for uh, really coming up with something incredibly concise. Uh, public interest technology refers to the study and application of technology expertise to advance the public interest, generate public benefits, promote the public good. And I want to give either of you the opportunity sort of to, to dive into that as it was initially constructed. Um, you there are three uh, points that underscore that. If you could just elaborate that as a, as a starting point for all of us before we get into uh, issues of what might come next and, and, and how that has performed a little bit. Deirdre, Dave, David, do you want to, uh, one of you want to take up the I'd, I'd slight love, elaboration of that? I'd love to defer to Deirdre first, but um, I'm happy to dive in. Uh, sh sure. I, Dave, why don't you go since you started? Well, I think, so for me, like the, the, if I think about the kind of expanded definition of, and certainly what I saw as like a big challenge in coming up with this definition is, A, this is a very, very, is a very, very broad area that we're trying to harness and capture as a field. And then there's a spectrum of people that I think we're also trying to bring together. And so I was, I was, when we were constructing this, I was very concerned about how do we make sure that this isn't just about creating more expertise and, and kind of creating what I think are ultimately going to be inter interdisciplinary experts who are kind of connecting the humanities and technology to think about how technology applies to public interest, but also creating people on the other end of the spectrum who are going to be effective consumers of those expertise. Because we're going to have a, a, a large number of people who are going to be making decisions about um, our society and our future are not going to be these experts. The decision makers are going to be people who are politicians or um, administrators and public officials um, or even CEOs or nonprofit holders. And so how do they have enough knowledge to actually engage with the experts and be able to know if they're getting good advice and challenge them and then take that advice and run with it? And so I think one thing that we try to do in this definition is and not make it too broad, but make it inclusive enough for that spectrum that I think really matters. Yeah. Great, Deirdre. Uh, yeah, uh, so um, it was a really fun exercise to work on this definition, you know, with the group of folks um, that we had at the time. Um, you know, Ed Felton um, at Princeton and Tara McGinnis and Jeremy Weinstein at Stanford, Tara at New America, David and I, you know, we, um, we sit in different departments and um, some of it, you know, I've known Ed for, I don't know, 20 years or something, you know, some of us had worked together for a long time in this area and some of us were really just meeting each other for almost the first time. And um, I think there were a few things and that uh, really um, carried us forward. And one, you know, you were talking about responsible innovation and responsible research. And I think one of the things that we really wanted to be clear about in this definition of the public interest technology field was the orientation towards social justice, right? We can do responsible innovation and be developing for private interests. We can do responsible research and being developed, you know, developing something that is purely for private gain. And I think here, what we viewed as really distinct was the orientation towards public service, towards social justice, towards the, the public good. And I think that there was an understanding that we needed a set of interdisciplinary experts who not only had expertise, as David was saying, 
that spanned multiple disciplines, but we also needed to cultivate communities um, of interdisciplinary practice that were gonna be specifically oriented towards public service, social justice, et cetera. And I think that that's very similar to the effort that was led by the Ford Foundation and others around public interest law, right? That lawyers, we are trained to be ethical, but there's also a subset of us who really wanna use our tools in service of the public good, the common good. Um, the second thing that I think is um, important was often people, I think from the social sciences, um, from the humanities, and even from the professional schools are um, viewed as kind of in service of innovation or in service of more technical expertise. And I think this document was really an effort to say, we, these are complementary expertise and we need people who kind of fully embrace the fact that to be a really strong practitioner in this space, you need all of those things. Um, and another, key, I mean, there's many things to talk about, but I think another thing that um, David Eves really brought to the table, which I think was a really important and significant thing, I um, kind of think about as a uh, almost a feminist ethics um, in that in the definition, um, he really wanted to emphasize in the, the kinds of skills people needed that they needed empathy, engagement and negotiation. And I think those are, are incredibly important. You know, if you wanna do interdisciplinary work, there is a degree of modesty and humility you need to bring. And a little bit of, you know, I, I was the kid who was always like, what does that mean? I didn't understand like totally like the willingness to ask questions because people are often using terms in ways that are completely different. And if you aren't willing to be the person who asks the question, um, the work is never gonna progress, right? And to do that, you need people who are willing to be kind of active listeners and willing to answer questions, right? That, that, that kind of empathy and engagement. And then I think the other part that's important in that empathy and engagement I remember teaching when I first moved over to the School of Information in our master's students class where I teach a, um, a required course on information law and policy. And I would have students who'd be like, oh, there's not even any computer scientists in Congress. And I was like, yeah, there's not a lot of doctors either, but that doesn't mean that they don't have the capacity to understand and craft meaningful law in this place and you cannot come in being dismissive or snooty, right? That you need to go in and understand that your job is to actually meet people halfway. And I think cultivating people with the skills of modesty and humility, empathy, engagement, and bridge building is really essential to building a field because none of us advance towards social justice alone, right? That the kinds of people who we wanna bring into or the field we're trying to develop, they have to be part of social justice coalitions. They have to work well in government agencies. They have to work well on the Hill or wherever it is they're gonna be. And so I think David brought that to the table, which I think is incredibly important. So Deirdre, I, I love the, the metaphor of, of meeting halfway in these interdisciplinary conversations. It's one of my rules of interdisciplinary collaboration, actually, to be willing to go more than halfway, uh, because uh, there are also a set of power dynamics that underlie the relationships with, as, as you also suggested in the, uh, uh, the, the perception that sometimes that the humanities and social sciences may be in service to the natural sciences and engineering, um, that being willing to go uh, more than halfway, take that extra little step that you're not actually asking for everything that you're giving uh, of your potential collaborators, a great way to get those collaborations started. Um, Sylvester, you described uh, just very briefly in your introduction, um, part of this perspective coming from the humanities and then succeeding in building a large uh, project set of teams. Uh, what do you think about the, the interdisciplinarity uh, from the perspective of the humanities that's been built into Pitt? Yeah, thanks so much, David. I think the definition and the conceptualization that's articulated in this document is really brilliant in any way, many ways. I think it's is timeless in its emphasis on being civic-minded and really emphasizing the interest for a public 
Uh, I can't imagine that will ever get out of date. If it does, we're really in trouble. <laughs> so the the foresight and I think the, the longevity that has shaped this articulation is really wonderful. I think it's also really important to, to build on and draw on this focus on uh, comprehensive approaches, moving across disciplines. And there are different terminologies that people use, multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity. And articles have been written trying to parse how those are or are not the same thing. But I think the, the important takeaway is that there is no single discipline or, or any particular set of disciplines that we can point to exclusively and say, these alone are the disciplines that people are going to come from in order to address the leadership challenge with technology. There is no area of knowledge or expertise that is irrelevant to guide, guiding and governing technology and addressing these challenges. And so the, the inclusivity at the level of knowledge and skills and methods and approaches, I think, is really one of the inspiring things about this definition of public interest technology. Uh, with, with an eye particularly to the humanistic disciplines and, and human-centered approaches, um, I think it's important to appreciate that one of the changes that we're now seeing in the legibility of technical challenges or technology is the easy apprehension of the fact that we need expertise from across areas, from across disciplines, from across sectors. Uh, that, that's a lot easier for people to see today than it was 20 years ago. If you look at the debates that are happening, that, and I, I think this is not so much that we're smarter than we were 20 years ago. I think that the technology has just reached a, a place where it shapes so many aspects of our lives. Everything from what counts as money. If you have digital currency, what do you do with central banking if, if you have uh, cryptocurrency, for example? And, and that kind of question or challenge is, is not necessarily an engineering question, per se. It's about uh, the, the very philosophical concept of what counts as money. It's about the legal apparatus and regulatory frameworks around it. I think also, if we look at something like the impact that technology is having on, on highly vulnerable populations, it becomes even more important for us to, to really invest in uh, the Pitt UN's emphasis on diversity and inclusion. The more highly vulnerable populations you include in whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter what you're doing, the more you're inclusive of, of people who have the most to lose when things go wrong, the better outcomes you're going to get in that guidance or governance process. And, and that's true of anything. It's especially true of technology. So that's not even about disciplinarity. It's also about who has the most to, to lose or who is most vulnerable to problems not being addressed or to uh, a, a very narrow demographic of people exclusively who are getting to shape or control policy or design or implementation and make decisions about technology. There are things like the future of work. So your example, David, you were, you were clearly a very precocious young child <laughs> thinking, thinking so early at the age of five about the future of work and, and technology, uh, but definitely that's, that's an equity issue. So I think the, the definition is really inspiring. I think that uh, the team that put it together did a great job of, of just keeping it very open while also giving clear substance to it. And the substance not being around a set of departments or disciplines or topics, but rather around what are the outcomes we want. We want civic-minded, public interest, uh, in, invested work to achieve those outcomes that are going to create the most equitable situation that is going to give us a kind of society that we actually want to live in. And I think this is relevant also to some of the ways that Pitt UN then has, has been in turn shaping the way that uh, public interest technology functions because the, the funding has supported uh, disciplines across our colleges and universities. So there's a lot of representation from arts and, and humanities, as well as law or policy, as well as uh, engineering and education. So you see that representation that's been very intentional. And uh, the, the call for funding has also been very explicit in really thinking about how we need to design the work that we do if we're serious about 
public, when we say the public. So uh, one of the, the points in that definition is that if, if you're only talking about a single demographic of the public, that's not really public interest. You, you have to mean everybody, it's gotta be broad. And so you have to be deliberate about being inclusive. And, and the funding calls have reflected that commitment so that we get the outcomes that we need. So I wanted to push uh, perhaps each of you to, to think about the, that hard to define public interest. And I think Sylvester was getting there in the latter part of, of his remarks. The definition, the, the blog post, the four pager that we're familiar with uh, from the beginning of this conversation acknowledges that the public interest is very difficult to define. Uh, my background, my disciplinary background, I did mention I'm a political scientist, and this is one of the challenges that uh, my discipline, whatever fealty I owe to it, which is very minimal, uh, faces in the world and thinking about the variety of ways in which people uh, might define the public interest. And I've heard some sort of proto definitions in here, um, but also the variety of ways in which people reject the public interest or reject defining the public interest uh, or reject conceiving of such a thing, even linguistically perhaps, that there is a public rather than a set of publics or a mass of individuals. And I think we've seen some of those issues even percolate up in the context of the most recent campaign. I think we've seen a lot of those issues, um, you know, be uh, right in our faces in the context of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and how it erupted uh, in all sorts of ways in uh, over the past year uh, into the the public and political consciousness. And if you look at the exit polls, uh, issues of, of equity um, one way or another were involved in a lot of people's uh, opinions as they went to the polls. So I'm wondering, you know, I guess the fundamental question here is, um, you know, we're often used to thinking about science, technology, innovation as something uh, neutral as something from which politics uh, has been interests has been extracted. And that's, you know, the the image that most of the public has of science, technology and innovation is if it gets complicated is more a sort of, you know, uh, a, a tool that can be used in, in one way or another. Um, and then these issues politicize science, technology or innovation. Yet what I take our enterprise is trying to do is say, no, wait a minute. It's not political. It's not that the politics is added at the back end, that there is a politics, there are a set of values that are intimately interwoven with science, technology, innovation from the very start of this. How is it that we get that across in the context of a public interest where sometimes even speaking of public interest is fraught? I'm, I'm happy to start that off. And I, I, Dave, I know this is a, an area where you do research and I'm sure you have lots to share too. Um, but I, you know, on, on obviously the very first thing, the questions of like what, what things, what problems we think are worth solving, what questions we think are worth asking are all of course very political um, in nature. But I think that the public interest technology field that we're imagining is one that understands that everything from the problems we choose to focus on to the decisions that we make in how we model things, in how we engineer them, the assumptions that we make about humans and organizations and behavior, um, all of those things are inherently political choices. And, you know, like all of you, I, people have been, I teach a uh, large undergrad, well, large for me, 145 students, right? Um, not large for some of you, I'm sure, uh, called Behind the Data, Humans and Values in our undergraduate data science curriculum. And people have been asking me, how's it going this year? And I'm like, well, you know, we, we talked about, you know, do artifacts have politics? And we talked about the difference between data and CAPTCHA. And then I had them explore Zoom and think about the way in which Zoom reorganizes, right? power and authority. Like imagine me going over in the classroom and doing this to you, right? Like that would not be cool, right? Or imagine deciding you can have, you know, ongoing side chats while I'm lecturing. That would not be cool. Yet here it's all cool, right? 
Um, and so in some ways, this semester in the cloud, I think we're now, most of us are looking at a year in the cloud, I think is providing, providing um, a really interesting opportunity for other people to um, really experience the way in which our technical choices and the designs of systems and the things we choose to use technology for and not, right? Because there've been very interesting acts of resistance, right? The resistance to the algorithm in the UK for determining A-levels, resistance to remote proctoring, I think at many universities across the country, um, questions of accessibility and privacy and security as people have experienced Zoom bombing and people, you know, I, I won't even go into some of the privacy issues that have arisen. Um, uh, so I think that um, the, 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 um, the, the grounding and focus on how integrated politics and technology are couldn't be more apparent than they are at this particular moment within the educational community because all of a sudden technology is affecting teaching and research and even access to campus in ways that people heretofore kind of didn't quite realize. You know, for many of them, their blinders were on. And as we know, you know, once systems are stable, right, they become the background infrastructure and people don't see their politics. It's at these moments of transition where we have like this unique moment of possibility where people all of a sudden realize because the politics have been upended, their expectations have been unsettled. So I think this is an incredibly fruitful time for those of us who are trying to build a greater understanding of the deeply social and political nature of technical systems and their integration into different spheres of social life. Sylvester, can I toss this back to you too? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that it's, it be, it's definitely important for us to consider all of those factors. And we're thinking about the public. I uh, think it's especially uh, critical that we keep in mind the different levels of vulnerability. Um, and, and so one of the things that I think is it's helpful for articulating and conceptualizing how we need to approach the question of the public has been articulated already in, in that uh, definition. And, and Deirdre, you've referred to this a few times and David Eves as well, and that is social justice. Uh, so that brings the question then, where is the injustice? Where is the inequity? Uh, so I had said earlier that when we think about the people who have the most to lose from things going wrong or from problems not being addressed and not just excluding them in the decisions, but thinking about them, <laughs> but actually including them in the process of figuring out uh, the, the knowledge, developing the regulatory frameworks or the teaching, whatever it is that we're doing. Uh, we're, we're always going to get better outcomes, even if we don't end up with the perfect situation. And so that, that should not be thought of in a static way, that here are the 10 people who have the most to lose. And we can just go through all the issues, and it's the same 10 people who have the most. It depends on what we're talking about. If we're dealing with healthcare decisions uh, and the use of could be data infrastructure around privacy or getting access to data or decision making, diagnosis of, of medical presentations, for example, uh, then we have to think about the populations with respect to that issue who might have the most to lose. If we're, if we're looking at the use of algorithms in law enforcement, things change. We know that there's huge disparity in race and policing. If, if we're looking at military decisions and you know we really need a global approach to this. So if we're talking about weaponizing AI, uh, that's not one political party versus another. It's really different regions of the world where these weapons are gonna be deployed and by whom and, and which peoples then become most highly vulnerable. But all of that, I think, um, tells us that when we approach the question of the public, we have to recognize we're not talking about a static notion of the public. Uh, we have to recognize the need to be dynamic and to be nimble in, in shifting from one focus to another if we're really concerned about equity. And if we really do want outcomes that, that give us uh, democratic outcomes, I mean that in the small d sense of, of really e equal access to uh, equal results 
and, and just situations, then we have to recognize that's going to depend on what issue we're talking about. And, and if we are using that as our barometer to figure out who, when things go wrong, who's going to be the most hurt by this? Who's going to suffer the most? Who's going to, who's, who could lose the most? Who could be the most devastated? Uh, that approach is going to give us more equitable results. Great. And I just want to uh, remind people, at least according to the counter in front of me, we've got about 15 minutes before I want to turn over to uh, broader Q&A. Uh, David, just as a sort of exit question around the definition and, and how it was constructed and, and where it's been, do you as one of the creators see any uh, soft spots, see any weaknesses as Pitt has played out uh, since the crafting of the definition? Apologies, it's 2020. Um, I think the, the, I'd like to answer that by linking it actually with this previous question, because I think it's, it's not surprising to me that Pitt has happened now in the moment that it's happening. You know, I think about like industrial policy and technology policy in the United States and globally, like I, I read like the Vannevar Bush biography, like last summer, or the summer before. And I think about how the United States and many other places have really seen like technology is a place where we just push as far and as fast forward as we possibly can. And that this does two things. One is it encourages speed and encourages siloization. So we can specialize to move forward as fast as we possibly can. And what's now happening in the digital context is that technology is now matured enough that it's starting to form, like you say, well, what is the public interest? I can't answer that question, but I can tell you what public infrastructure is. And it's very clear now that this, the like, digital technologies are now at a point where people are suddenly waking up and realizing, wait a minute, all of this stuff that we've been building, this is now digital infrastructure. And this is an infrastructure problem. And the way that we think about equity around an infrastructure problem, I think is different than how we think about equity around a consumer type problem. And so if I think about like the law, well, it took us 5,000 years before we, I think, really started to think about equity in the law. And when I think about physical infrastructure, you know, it's not the story is actually not that much better. Like I, I talk a lot of my students about accessibility and like curb cutouts. So the fact that people in wheelchairs can navigate the streets and how that innovation actually benefited like me with who had kids in a wheelchair, like nothing like better than not waking your kid up as you're bouncing down a street and getting up a street, like how that benefited a whole bunch of people and how it took us again, thousands and thousands of years before we started to realize that the infrastructure in the physical sense had to be built for everybody. And we had an inclusive and kind of social justice framework around that. And so I think right now we're at this very important tipping point where digital infrastructure is being recognized as public infrastructure. And we're trying to, I, I think part of our goal is to apply this lens to that infrastructure and, and ask these questions now as opposed to 2000 years from now after it's all built and baked and it's too hard to rip out and inequities have been even further entrenched in our society. So that's why I think Pitt UN is happening right now is because we recognize that need. The challenge with that and the, the kind of the shortcoming of the definition is um, I've been doing this work trying to get faculty around the world to figure out what is the minimum knowledge around digital that public leaders need to have. And NASPA, which is the body that accredits public policy schools in the United States has actually removed technology as a requirement for certification. And I think the, and the reason they did that is because it became so diffuse that it was hard to tell what was digital. And I kind of laugh because I'm like, yeah, that's the reality of our world. Digital is now part of everything. And so the challenge for us is how are we trying to wrap our hands or, or our hands around what is it now effectively everything? Because everything has a digit, every service is a digital service. Everything touches digital. And so how do we wrap our hands around that and still leave it be coherent? It's just like an enormously complex challenge. Great. There's, I, I, I want to I move on, and um, I'm going to come to you next, actually, Deirdre, so if you want to weave it into the next <laughs> set of comments, please do, but I want to um, begin a transition. So, um, you know, Deirdre, in your earlier comments about things that you taught, you referenced, uh, uh, at least obliquely, Langdon Winner's Do Artifacts Have Politics, and Winner is a incredibly important thinker for me as well, because I lodge my normative 
uh, perspective in the identity that Winner created between technology and legislation. And he said that, you know, legislation is not just like, uh, he said that technology is not just like legislation. They're really two forms of precisely the same thing. They're things that we do collectively to create the structures through which we, uh, we live our lives and pursue what we see as, uh, as good in the world. And therefore, if we have a set of underlying norms and institutions and so on that relate to how it is that we make laws, and we can refer to those roughly as, as democratic institutions, maybe we should have the same sort of norms and values and institutions directed toward our construction of, uh, of technology. Oh, here's Sujatha. Um, Apologies. Um, I got okay. the timer on, so I'm going to um, leave. And... So we'll get to you in a second, Sujatha. Um, and so part of what I think the conversation around public interest in the context of public interest technology is, is about reconfiguring how it is that we think about the public-private divide around technology. And over the past year or two, we've seen some of that reconfiguration coming from the private sector side uh, as well. So... Um, uh, who is it? It's uh, uh, BlackRock, the you know the huge uh, investing group, has uh, now put some incredibly uh, interesting sort of conditions on what it is that they are or are not going to invest in. The business roundtable has started talking in terms of of stakeholder capitalism and not just shareholder capitalism. There are other kinds of examples uh, coming back from the private sector that go beyond. Uh, corporate social responsibility that had been, you know, the a sort of pale version, in my opinion, of simply being a, a decent actor in a, in the community. So, um, Deirdre, particularly perhaps from your perspective, having been attached to public interest law and now moving into public interest technology, where on the law side, there's, you know, there's a deeply embedded value of pro bono work uh, among private sector lawyers. What would it look like if we had pro bono work among engineering firms? Um, you know, what do you see, um, you know, do you see the private sector um, meeting us halfway? That was a whole lot of questions. Um, I'm gonna start with the uh, Langdon winner and, um, you know, in Artifacts, do Artifacts have politics? He also uh, references Lewis Mumford, right? And this idea about inherently political technologies. And the reason I wanted to do that is one of the things that we touched on in our definitions is there's this one line that says, this means that efforts to constrain the bad use of technology or to mitigate the harmful impacts of technology are also a part of the field. And one of the things that I think has been most interesting um, recently is the reemergence of the challenges to the idea that technology is always liberating or is always about innovation. Um, and my colleague, Jenna Burrell and I um, run um, the Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Working Group at Berkeley. And we just held this multi-day conference on refusal. Um, and one of the things that I think has been kind of like the moment, right? We, we've seen companies deciding to stop selling or stop researching or put a halt on the, the um, facial recognition technology, right? And we've seen communities refusing it and saying, no, we, we don't wanna use that technology. And I think that there's this moment where all of a sudden people are thinking this reflects both, I think a deeper understanding of um, the politics of, of technology. It doesn't matter that they might get the matching part better, right? It's that introducing it into systems where we've had systematic racism is going to yield unjust results, no matter how quote unquote unbiased the technology itself in some like way might be, or we could make it. Um, and I think that this um, understanding that there is some public interest that goes beyond um, just the kind of innovation impulses of any individual company that should be a lens. And we've seen, um, it's interesting, we've seen employees within companies talking not just about stakeholders instead of shareholders, because we see companies talking about stakeholder orientation, not just shareholder and orientation in a bit of a swing back, right? There's a pendulum issue here. But um, 
we, we've also seen the employees in particular who've been protesting against different corporate um, technical efforts very explicitly using the language of human rights, right? They've not been solely using the language of ethics. And I think that um, the, the rise of that human rights language and that lens through which we look at technical design as well as the kind of use and implementation. So understanding that it's, it's not gonna just be what's baked into the system. It's gonna be how we choose to deploy it in society and that companies can't just like wipe their hands, that those questions about is your technology gonna be used out in the world in a way that um, furthers ideas of the public good it is something that it's not so easy to walk away from. And I think that that's been an, an important development and I think really builds the appetite for the public interest technology field within the commercial sector, as well as within the public interest sector, where obviously there, it's already very well aligned. And so I don't think it's at all surprising that, um, you know, at least for us at the School of Information, some of our postdocs and PhD students and master's students are getting jobs in the kind of ethical AI or machine learning practices within companies. And I think it's precisely because they understand that they need to be thinking about the social and political implications of technology while they are developing or potentially choosing not to develop or to gate or to control or to limit certain functionality. Um, so I think that one, I think we could have spoken more strongly to kind of the concept of refusal as part of the things that are in the public interest technology field. Um, and I also think it's one of the really interesting developments that's broadening the appetite and interest for the public interest technology field's growth. Great. So I want to welcome our, our fourth panelist, Sujatha Raman, um, who is uh, coming from the completely other side of, of the planet from where I am. And it's, I think, very early in her day. So thank you for making uh, the effort to, to be with us, Sujatha. Um, at the beginning of the program, I gave folks the opportunity to introduce themselves very briefly and to share with us with, uh, with us a, a sort of tidbit about themselves personally and a, perhaps a, a very brief uh, introduction to how you became introduced to public interest technology or something like it uh, in, in your life history. And then from there, I'll just in, invite you to reflect, um, as I think we uh, prepared a little bit, to reflect on uh, a topic that you've been deeply involved with, the concept of responsible innovation, and uh, how that has been uh, you know, part of the a global framing of these cognate issues that we're trying to deal with in PIT, and any reflections about uh, RI and PIT that you might have. So Sujatha. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And um, thank you for this opportunity. It's very exciting for me. And I'm so sorry uh, to be um, very late to the party. Um, you would think that in this day and age, it's very easy to calculate uh, time differences. But um, yeah, just had that wrong. Um, so um, I was, you know, when Dave gave me this uh, invitation, uh, I didn't have to think twice about saying yes, because I've been interested in kind of public interest issues. Um, for a long time. Um, uh, so growing up in India, uh, it was something that was, well, although I was a science student, um, it, it was uh, questions of, you know, social good, public good, social justice, you know, were, were of deep interest to me. Um, you know, you can be a nerd, um, but still be interested in those questions. Um, but um, I think in India, I didn't, uh, at the time, um, I didn't know of things like, for example, people's science movements, uh, participatory technology design, uh, those sorts of things, which I think are the root of, um, of the questions that uh, the panel is considering today. Um, but um, it wasn't until I uh, moved to the um, US, uh, Virginia Tech in particular, that I discovered that you could actually put these two pieces together. So questions to do with science, scientific research, technology uh, on the one hand, uh, and questions to do with uh, social good, public good uh, on the other. Um, and so for me, I guess uh, one maybe missed opportunity, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, uh, um, another route that I might have taken had I got a job that I applied for 25 years back, uh, which was with the Loka Institute. 
so the Loka Institute is, I think, one of the um, yeah, early examples of attempts to uh, bring communities together uh, into uh, exploring questions of technology futures. Uh, I know Dick Sklover, of, co of course, was a student of Langdon Winnell, very highly influenced by him, but very interested in um, moving beyond um, looking at questions to do with science, technology, and society simply as a sort of an academic, uh, a set of academic questions, uh, and actually trying to promote that um, in the world, if you like. Uh, and so my own, um, my own life has taken me in lots of directions. I think I got very close to the local job, uh, didn't quite land it. Um, but uh, since then, I have uh, lived in the UK, um, and then more recently in, in Australia, a couple of years I've been here. Uh, and to me, one of the reasons I'm, why I'm still, uh, I guess, interested in these questions and I'm still around and you know, haven't sort of thrown it all up and gone off to do something else uh, is because uh, the whole kind of field of uh, responsible innovation, which I think over the last 10 years has really gained a, a certain kind of impetus uh, for bringing together a number of questions around, uh, which were, I think, previously explored under um, uh, sort of the labels like technology assessment, participatory technology assessment, um, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and for me, what, what's uh, distinctive about responsible innovation in the way in which, uh, of course, Dave uh, and his colleagues uh, in um, Arizona State University, uh, but also uh, European, so my former European colleagues, uh, both in the UK, but also Netherlands, Germany, uh, uh, European Commission, and, and so forth, the way in which they have uh, developed this, uh, I think the way in which it's distinctive is sort of learning the lessons of the history of technological uh, developments and thinking about, you know, how can we um, actually, uh, going back to, uh, I think, uh, Deidre, as, as you were saying, going back to the question of what gets baked into the technological systems in the first place, right? And how can we influence those? Uh, how can we work together with different um, organizations, different publics, uh, but also, uh, at the end of the day, working with um, engineers, working with scientists, people who are involved in um, uh, developing technologies. Uh, you know, how can we engage with them in a productive way, uh, in an empathetic way, so you understand, you know, what their kind of constraints are, um, but also bring in uh, uh, and explore some of the possibilities that we have for, um, uh, yeah, tra transforming uh, technological systems in the public good. So kind of redesigning. So I think that issue of sort of, you know, what gets baked into the system has been very much at the heart of um, notions of responsible innovation. Um, uh, now, just one uh, kind of comment before I, um, and apologies, I've gone dark, the light has gone off, but I, I will turn, turn that back on. Um, one of the ways in which I think this has been um, maybe so somewhat, um, been somewhat unfortunate in the way in which it's been understood is that because of the label responsible, uh, it's sometimes um, people hear that as something to do with the research integrity. Uh, and the you know, the, then the sense is, well, we already have principles for research in integrity and so forth, uh, you know, beyond, uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, sort of committing fraud and, you know, so on. And, and, we, and we have guidelines, we have procedures for de dealing with those questions. So I think some of the ways in which responsible innovation has been kind of uh, understood um, not necessarily, obviously, by the people who have uh, developed it, but, but by the way it's been taken up is in, in a somewhat narrow way. But uh, I think there's still uh, plenty of opportunities for the kinds of questions uh, that the Public Interest uh, Technology Network has posed. Um, and uh, many of you, I think, will have already been uh, talking about uh, today. Uh, and I just wanted to give one example, uh, if you don't mind, Dave, uh, if I haven't run out of time. Uh, and that is, um, I mean, one of the things that's very customary, okay, at this point, I think would, this is weird, so I'm gonna turn the light back on. Ah, just needed to move. Okay, um, so uh, I come, I'm speaking to you from um, the land of the first Australians, uh, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. And it is customary in, uh, in this country uh, to acknowledge uh, that this is the land on which we are speaking. This is the land, the custodianship of this land by uh, indigenous people has made, you know, lots of things possible, including the very existence of this uh, university. Um, and one of the ways in which this is, I think, directly relevant to uh, the topic of the panel is that there is an emerging movement uh, for um, working not just for Aboriginal people, 
but with and sometimes by uh, efforts by ab uh, Aboriginal people, uh, Indigenous people in this country uh, to redesign, to design technologies uh, that actually serves uh, their interests, uh, that uh, addresses the, you know, the history of um, uh, colonial outrage uh, in, the, in this country, but also addresses the needs of um, uh, indigenous communities uh, in Australia uh, today. So I think that is a very, very um, kind of exciting and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a hard slog. It's going to be, uh, you know, very challenging, but that's, I think, one aspect of the way in which responsible innovation kind of ideas uh, is playing out in Australia and uh, is one to watch, I, I think, in the next few years. Great, thank you, Sujathan. Uh, as I mentioned, I uh, think that it is part of the intention of the network to uh, to turn a little bit more uh, of its face toward the global context. And as part of that in, we'll now start to go to some of the questions that are rolling in from uh, the audience. Um, uh, another kind of global framework uh, from Jennifer Hirsch, uh, have any of you been engaged with the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Um, she says, we are doing so, and so is uh, BlackRock and lots of other stakeholders. Seems like a way to push Pitt further within a framework being widely adopted. Um, if I might, I would also inflect that to suggest that what differences, similarities, um, or differences might you see between a framework that emphasizes sustainability and a framework that emphasizes public interest technology. Um, who might want to jump in here? David's smiling, let's give it to him. <laughs> no? That'll be a lesson to teach anybody to smile at a good question. Um, <laughs> uh, I, so the one thing is I, I do actually, so I actually would very much like for Pitt to have a more global focus and kind of a global attention. Uh, there's a story I often tell. I, um, one, of the, one of the ways that I have some privilege living in the United States is that people make assumptions. And one thing they assume is that I'm American um, and I'm not. And uh, I remember very well uh, when the Snowden disclosures happened and that the president at the time came down onto the Rose Garden and made a big announcement that said that Americans should not be worried that no one is being illegally spied on. And I can say that with an absolute confidence that the other 6.7 billion people or whatever it is on the planet really parsed those words pretty carefully um, because they realized what the, what the inverse of that statement was. And um, we're, we're not going to have all too often, I feel like, because the, many of the companies and the infrastructure we're built in the United States is the assumptions that the solutions are going to come from within the United States. And, and this is, these are now global issues. Um, even just the other day, there was a, a it was a nonprofit kind of organization I saw get started up that was going to try to help solve some of these problems. And I looked at the advisory board and it was entirely composed of Americans. And I was like, this just makes, these problems are not American problems. These are Brazilian problems. They're Indian problems. These are global problems. And I, to, at some risk of being overly candid, I, I just don't think the Americans or all Americans have really caught up with the fact that these are global issues and that the world actually wants to say in thinking about how global public digital infrastructure is going to be managed. That makes the problem a lot more difficult for us to address. And I'm deeply concerned about issues of sustainability and of freedom and of democracy. And I want to make sure those are at the heart of it. But this does need to become a global conversation. And I want to get uh, this back to Sujatha as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, one of the ways in which um, maybe we should be thinking about global problems like um, those exemplified by the SDGs um, that's relevant to our context is that um, you know, very often you will have, um, you know, American engineers or scientists, uh, European uh, engineers, Australian engineers, um, who, you know, go off into other countries and, um, if you like, offer technological solutions uh, to some of the problems that, um, you know, uh, might, might be seen as, if you like, solutions to the uh, SDGs. Um, but um, in a way, I think what, when we start bringing in questions of uh, public interest technology into that uh, into that equation. I think it helps to enhance um, some of the reasons why that kind of activity, you know, the global kind of ro roving activity, if you like, um, of uh, many of these researchers, uh, you know, actually needs to um, needs to be more kind of dialogical, participatory. There are plenty of examples of, of that sort of thing emerging. 
um, but really kind of learning the lessons of even in very simple cases, like trying to develop improved cook stoves is one, one area that I've been involved in. You know, it's been a movement for 40 years, 45 years. Um, and very often it's uh, gone all right because you, uh, the assumption is you can develop, design something uh, in a lab in uh, Sydney or, uh, you know, Phoenix, for example, and then you can just literally transport it uh, elsewhere in the world, right? So um, I think the public interest uh, framing can help um, kind of uh, bring attention to uh, the importance of, you know, doing, doing that kind of global work in a, in a better way. Great. So I've got another question um, uh, from the audience from Mark Royovich Preslar. Um, and I think I'm probably going to start with uh, Sylvester on this one. So uh, pay attention, Sylvester. Uh, Mark is curious about what uh, you all think about um, what we could and should do better to track the uh, and influence the impact of technological change on society, particularly focusing on the disruptive nature of technology. Our society, he writes, seems to be suffering from the unintended consequences of these revolutionary changes. Now, uh, attention to that question was built in uh, to the definition. There's been you know, scholarship over the long period of time, going back to folks that we mentioned, like Winner and even uh, Mumford, in trying to grapple with this. Um, Sylvester, what are your thoughts about what kind of progress we've made in, in grappling with these things that uh, are hard to predict, hard to anticipate, uh, but yet necessary to govern? Yes, this is a great question. I think certainly one, one clear example that you were already working on at age five, David, was a future work. <laughs> uh, so the World Economic Forum has actually uh, produced some very sophisticated anticipatory analysis of the disruptions in labor structures, uh, which is a huge concern uh, one, these, there's one economy, it's the global economy, and that's the only one there is. And, and so the ripple effects and the impact of the disruption in labor is, is always something that needs to be understood transnationally, globally, which is with supply chains, you know, with the shifts in GDP, uh, the concentrations of wealth. There are other things that we have also been, been tracking uh, that I think has demonstrated some clear progress and robust attention. If we look at the use of AI systems, uh, particularly in surveillance, uh, that has garnered a lot of analysis from people in government, and particularly in our research institutions, uh, think tanks, uh, human rights or civil liberties organizations. There are other things that are not necessarily as easy to study, but that are nonetheless important. And that has to do with more, you can call them cultural shifts uh, that aren't necessarily reducible to, to labor, to jobs, to employment. But it could be, for example, the way these technologies affect our social relationships, uh, the sense of, of closeness or intimacy that people experience. Uh, and, and that can be unpredictable. So we should not assume that digital technology isolates people. Uh, David Eves, your point about the enabling effects of this technology for being able to, to do writing is something. So people, the fact that we're able to have this conference right now, <laughs> despite a global pandemic, is just indicative of one way that technology can actually enable people to connect and to experience uh, a world out there. We've come to rely on it, I think, more as we've been sheltered in or locked down or confined to our homes for safety reasons that we're still able to have birthday calls, that kind of thing. But, that, but that's cultural. And, and I think as we try to, to be forward thinking to understand the impact of this on something like the delivery of learning in higher ed, uh, that's less certain. It's, it's not clear exactly how that's gonna play out. It's harder to predict, but it, it's a safe bet, I think, uh, to understand that the capacity for disruption is not contained in any sector. And I think it would be naive to assume that there's not going to be very much change to something like higher ed or to the delivery of healthcare, telemedicine. Uh, so those, there are some areas that have gotten more attention than others, uh, but I think there's always room for us to consider what we're overlooking in order to to be vigilant and to try to understand where the opportunities and the challenges are going to continue to emerge. So, Sylvester, in part of your answer, and going all the way back to the beginning definition, there is built into this pit perspective 
a, um, a disposition toward the future, uh, whether we're talking about the, the changes that we normally associate with technology and innovation, but that are, I think if we've danced around the borders of this statement, that are also fundamentally changes in, uh, in values that come from our intentions and our uh, institutions and the, the kinds of perspectives, political, moral, that we bring to the creative endeavor that we're engaged in. Um, and because it's essentially, well, maybe not essentially, but because it's importantly, a, uh, a future-oriented activity in which we're engaged in when we're engaged in PIT. I want to use as an exit question um, for you all this from uh, Ken Fleischman from the iSchool at UT Austin. Um, how can we use current and future media to orient today's five-year-olds toward PIT or five-year-olds in, uh, in our own futures? Um, and let's uh who wants to who wants to field that first but i'm going to go through everybody so i'll take volunteers sujatha go ahead um yeah i'm happy to jump in uh i'm not quite sure so i missed the, the five-year-old uh dave um but um it was it, it was my favorite book when I was five, which was Mike Mulligan and his Steam Shovel, which was a depression yeah. era book about technological unemployment. Unemployment, yeah. Um, so uh, I guess for me, one of the ways in which we can enthuse and motivate young people um, in this in this uh, vision of public interest technology is partly trying to sort of uh, change the way or stimulate um, attention to you know what we take to be novel, right? I think our culture, it's so uh, kind of, we're so used to defining novelty, um, you know, the exciting stuff, the innovative stuff uh, in terms of the technological, right? Something that's new, it gives you a new technological capability. Um, and so I think if we actually were to sort of open up that um, question, provide other examples of how, you know, novelty can come from, um, uh, from achieving the, the public interest, for, from achieving the public good, right? And, and doing that in conjunction with uh, the technological. Um, I mean, I just want to acknowledge a former PhD student of mine from Malawi, and he asked this amazing question. Uh, he said, you know, he was interested in technologies that were defined as pro-poor. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, he, he did research on these, and basically the finding was um, these things, you know, didn't do very much. Uh, to uh, address uh, problems of poverty. Uh, and his question was, maybe the issue here is that actually these technologies that are described as pro poor, they're not innovative enough, they're not novel enough. Uh, and for him, the definition was um, to be, to count as genuinely novel, um, it has to address the public interest, has to address the public good, the social good, um, as well as, uh, you know, meeting the, um, some kind of you know, te technological vision. So I think if we can sort of have more stories that um, actually convey that, um, that kind of uh, intimate connection between the social and the technological, um, so that we change our assumptions about what we take to be novel or innovative, that could be uh, a way forward and uh, to enthuse um, young people. Great, thank you. How about Deirdre? on this question of enthusing five-year-olds into the public interest technology? Um, so I, I, I think that um, some of the ways in which we would enthuse children or build their capacity to question and see the values in technical design um, are the same ways that we build kind of their capacity to see the values in our society, right? So travel books, movies, right? Things that help them understand that the ways in which we do things here, the, the, the infrastructure choices we've made about public transportation or like those things aren't given, right? That those are all political choices about how we spent our money and what we thought was valuable. And I think um, those same sorts of like those critical faculties that are built through kind of comparative understandings are so helpful 
in getting people to be questioning about, oh, does it have to be this way? Or why is it this way? Rather than just saying, oh, that's the way it is. So I think that's super important. And again, I think in this particular moment, you know, we have a bunch of five-year-olds who have all of a sudden realized they really love school, man. God, they want to go to school, right? Because they're experiencing the limitations and some of they're like, oh, well, you know, it turns out I really like the iPad for certain kinds of interaction, but it doesn't really facilitate these other kinds of interactions that I really want to have with my peers and my friends. And why don't they? Why, why are they so good at consumption and so bad at, you know, conveying other kinds or supporting other kinds of interactions? So I think we have this, um, again, there's this, you know, whenever our lives get kind of upended, there's this really sweet opportunity to be really reflective about what we value and, and why we value certain things. And so this moment for five-year-olds, I know many of you have them crying and, you know, and, and also the teachers who are experiencing all the parents in their classes, right? The, the teaching in a fishbowl. Um, but I think it's making us all very appreciative of well-designed technology, of the values built into technology and of the things that it doesn't really do very well. And maybe the things that we don't want it to do at all. Oh, great, great. Thank you, Deirdre. Sylvester. Yeah, I think that there are some wonderful conversations that can be generated with young children using this technology. You know, I think about our, our granddaughter who has uh, Alexa in their house and she got into a conversation with this about uh, who counted in the family, who was a member of their house, and, she, and, and our granddaughter wanted to include Alexa <laughs> as a speaker. Uh, there, there are all kinds of things and questions that come up, but I think there are opportunities then to talk to children about those things. Why is the voice of this assistant a female voice? You know, do you notice any others that aren't? And that's a great way to begin to talk to a child about uh, how gender functions as a social force and, and its impact. And, and, and so there are other ways that we can use these technologies, if, it, if it's AR or VR, uh, that, that aren't necessarily about technical things, but they could be about technical things, but they provide an inroad for young children to begin to understand and appreciate some of these larger societal questions. So I think the technology is actually very generative in that way, if we take it as an opportunity to engage with children in these conversations. And David, thank you. Just, I don't think I can say anything as intelligent as the other panelists, but I will say I do actually have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old. And the, the just two fun stories I would share that it caused me to think a lot is one is my five-year-old really likes to play Among Us, which is a, a game that you play online where one person, but he's, he wells up with tears whenever he's the imposter because he doesn't want to kill anyone. And so I think it, it leads to actually a really nice conversation about like, well, how does the technology cause you to feel this way? And, and I, so I, I just agree with Sylvester. I think there's like really nice entry points. And, but I think it's also causing me to ask questions. So my elder one, he likes, he, he never types, even though he could, he only wants to dictate. He only uses voice recognition software to, to write. And I, and I, part of me was kind of like, this is wrong. He should, he needs to be typing. And I could only imagine probably my parents thinking the same way about writing and typing because I typed everything. And so it, it's really forcing me to think, well, what is the value in that? And what is the importance of that? And then trying to have him to have that conversation and think, well, what skills do you think you're getting from this and from that? And, and I think it, it can lead into a whole set of nice conversations. So nothing is as smart as, as others, but, but a lived experience at the moment. No, that's, uh, that's great, David. And I'll, we'll uh, share in, in closing a story. I have a now 14 year old son uh, who, when he was eight years old, um, you know, rain and puddles are very scarce and, and wonderful things here in Arizona. And he was stomping in a puddle in after a spring rainfall. And I uh, shouted to him, watch out for the puddle gators. And he looked at me with wide eyes as if there were possibly such things as puddle gators that could be hiding in the puddle ready to get him. And um, he said, then he thought about it for a second. He said, daddy, there's no such thing as puddle, as puddle gators. And I said, but what if there, what if there were? And we proceeded to have a conversation, a very imaginative conversation, technically grounded to the extent that uh, a bright eight-year-old can technically ground that kind of conversation. Um, 
using our imaginations and fusing it with a little bit of science and technology. And that's actually a side point that we might have gotten to here. This conversation has uh, been dominated by attention to digital technology rather than, say, uh, biological technologies that may have just as important role to play in the 21st century in how we live our lives as, uh, as the digital. But that became, using our imaginations, a conversation about um, what the, uh, the capabilities of emerging science and tech are and the kinds of values that we might want to infuse with the decisions that are intertwined with our decisions about science and technology. So I wanna thank uh, the panelists, Deirdre and Sujatha and David and Sylvester for uh, helping us work through the now couple year old definition of PIT and its uh, continuing strengths in my opinion, the way that it uh, relates to a couple of other ideas that are out and about in the world like responsible innovation, uh, like what we're seeing coming down the pike in terms of uh, the stakeholder capitalism, its connection potentially to other broader global concepts like the sustainable development goals. I wanna thank uh, everybody who is behind the scenes at New America and elsewhere in putting forward this first of the pit plenaries and the rest of the program. And I will turn it back to Andrine to close us out and lead us into the next session.